the philosophy of Doctor Who, the Orville, Black Mirror, and many more will be discussed in this panel. Hi, I'm your moderator, Sandro Minetti, and joining us is a professor of philosophy with a true passion for sci-fi, Dr. David Kyle Johnson. A big virtual hello to you. Hi, Sandro. Thanks for having me on. I'm really looking forward to this. It's going to be a lot of fun. I think so, and I'm hoping you're going to help us understand and appreciate our favorite show in a different way. Talking of which, in your professional point of view, when you've wandered the earth as long as the Doctor and the galaxy, in fact, seeing despair, uh, death and delight, um, how does that shape your attitude, your philosophy on life for a character like that? Yeah, so let me talk about two things here. One, how the Doctor's perspective has likely changed or could change, and then how kind of what I do can change your view of Doctor Who, you know, your likely favorite television show, right? So for the Doctor, it's it's interesting what you would expect for to happen with the Doctor. Um, after wandering the universe for, you know, thousands of years um, and seeing all the death and destruction and, and, and all, the, all that the Doctor um, has seen, right, you would expect him to become a nihilist. Right, you'd expect him to to be cut like none of it matters. It's all like you know you're here for one moment, and then you know I can just tree, I can just get in my TARDIS, and you know in ten seconds you're you've been dead for a hundred years, right? Like that that none of it matters, all of it's meaningless. Uh, life itself would be meaningless. Um, saving a life would be meaningless, and that kind of stuff, right? Um, that's that's what you would expect. That's that's what I would expect that kind of life to do to someone, right? But it doesn't to the doctor, right? The doctor, generally speaking, sometimes. The doctor can kind of take on that persona where, you know, kind of bigger picture, we got to look at the bigger picture and save more lives. Like, you know, with, uh, I don't know, with like Vesuvius, right? You got to let Vesuvius explode. Yes, people are going to die, but they've, they're already dead. And so we just have to accept that, right? Um, but he very often is very concerned with the people that are involved. And he takes it personal when people die under his watch. And um, and uh, he, so he's not a nihilist at all. So you'd expect him to become a nihilist, but he's not. And honestly, I don't know how the doctor keeps it up, right? Like, I think I would become a nihilist if I was the doctor. Me too. And I saw the doctor had come. I was like, yeah, it doesn't matter. And, I, you know, I would kind of give up or whatever. And maybe that's what makes the doctor so heroic, right? Um, but is I, he I, really I, a hero, Kyle? Because his actions result in so many deaths. Yeah, so... In a certain kind of way, um, I, I can see your argument to say that he's that he's not a hero, right? Uh, but that objection, that kind of uh, that that line of reasoning that his actions lead to so many so, so many deaths, that could be applied to Superman, that could be applied to Batman, that could be applied to any kind of major superhero out there, right? That's actually one of the big issues in some of the most recent Superman movies, is that right? Like Superman, as he's fighting Zod or whatever, it destroys the entire city, and a lot of people die. As Collateral result. damage. It's, right, and it, but it's collateral damage, right? Um, but you know, that's maybe that's part of the price that you pay for being a hero, right? Um, one of the kind of interesting things to think about with the doctor is that even though he doesn't directly cause it, it seems that chaos follows him wherever he goes, right? So people, whenever he shows up somewhere, people start dying, and he has to solve the problem. And you start there's so much correlation, you have to start wondering if there is causation, right? Um, if he's if he's kind of responsible for that, right? But a, a friend of mine, uh, Mike Berry who co-wrote the Orville book with me, which we'll talk about after a bit. Um, he pointed out something one, once to me uh, one day that I really hadn't thought about, that really the Doctor is a, like a comic book superhero. Um, you don't, look, you kind of don't, normally don't think of that because you think of superheroes, you think of Superman and Batman and that kind of stuff, right? But like his superpower, of course, is his ability to travel in time. And of course, the sonic screwdriver, which definitely has kind of, it can kind of do anything kind of magic powers. Um, behind it, even though it's supposed to be scientific, what it does is almost inexplicable, right? Um, and that, especially when you look at him in the comic books or whatever, he is very much like a superhero. And so there's a legitimate interpretation, I think, um, that can define him not only as a hero, but also as a superhero. Um, but as you point out, like this is what's one of the things that makes Doctor Who so wonderful is that usually, especially with the classic Superman, Superman's just always the good guy. Um, Doctor Who, not always, right? Doctor Who sometimes can get in morally gray areas and sometimes do things that aren't always on the, you know, the moral up and up. And, and his companions have to come in and correct him, right? Amy has to set him straight 
about the star whale, right, on uh, Starship UK. Um, uh, uh, when it comes to Vesuvius, right, uh, it is Donna, right, who has to say, you know, he's like, they're all meant to die anyway. And he's like, it, she's like, at least save one person, right? <laughs> and of course, he saves Peter Capaldi, right? But um, like, the, so the, the, the companions sometimes have to set him on the straight and narrow because he's kind of lost his way a little bit, right? Um, and that just, that makes for great storytelling, right? I think it, it's better to have flawed heroes. Um, that, that's, that makes for a more interesting story. Yeah. Well, a flawed hero indeed, but uh, he and she has, uh, you know, I'm sure saved many more lives than have been lost. I, I'm curious to know how um, your own outlook on philosophy has been changed by your fandom, by characters like the Doctor and uh, other sci-fi uh, and comic book characters that, that, that you follow. Yeah, let me talk about two things here, because we can talk about how Doctor Who's changed me and then how the approach that we take, and I was kind of alluding this before, changes the way that you view Doctor Who. So let me just kind of talk generally about like my interaction with my students. Right now, um, I am teaching a sci-fi and philosophy class, which is based on one of the great courses we're, that, I, that I teach we're going to talk about a little bit later. And we not only talk about Doctor Who, we talk about, uh, I was telling you off air that today we were talking about The Matrix. I actually cosplay as the Merovingian in, uh, uh, in class. Um, and who's a determinist. And so we talked about- Why were my classes never this fun? Because <laughs> you didn't have me as a professor. That's I'm why. sorry, I'm um, interrupting your own question, but just, you know, can we just skip ahead? Tell us about this course that you teach and how we can sign up for it. It sounds great. Okay, so um, so I, what I'm teaching is a version of this course that I have for The Great Courses. The Great Courses is a product produced by The Teaching Company. You can find it online. If you look up The Teaching Company or The Great Courses, um, you'll, you'll find their website. Um, it, you can get it in video streaming. You can get it in audio format, CD format. It's an audio book. Um, you can buy the DVDs. Uh, they have a streaming service like Netflix called Wonderium, I believe. Um, and you can just pay a monthly service and get all of their courses, which includes mine. Um, and I've done a sci-fi course. I've done a big questions of philosophy course. I've done a metaphysics course for them. Um, in the sci-fi course, and so this actually is apropos to the question that I was talking about. So uh, the answer I was trying to give. So in the sci-fi course, what I try to do is treat science fiction as philosophy, not as something that raises, just merely raises philosophical questions, which it definitely does. But the argument kind of behind the course is that science fiction authors are often trying to put forth philosophic arguments. They are trying to convince you that certain things are true, trying to persuade you to adopt, adopt certain philosophical perspectives or moral perspectives. Um, and the, the goal of the course is to examine film and television science fiction in an effort to figure out what philosophical point or argument these things make, and then is the argument actually any good. So we talk about inception and the interpretation of art. I talk about the matrix and the value of true belief and the matrix sequels and whether or not we have free will. Um, I use Carl Sagan's contact to talk about the compatibility of religion and science. I, I use the Star Trek The Next Generation to talk about the possibility that we might actually live in a multiverse, that there might be multiple universes. I use Doctor Who to talk about whether or not time travel is actually possible. And if it is, what might it look like? What kind of characteristics would it have? Um, I also use the Doctor to talk about pacifism because the Doctor is a pacifist, supposedly, never uses weapons, that kind of stuff. I contrast that with the militarism that is argued against in Starship Troopers. So there is a there's a lecture in my course that Starship Troopers and the Doctor that kind of uh, uh, that uh, that juxtaposes the two kind of approaches that those movies uh, take. Although Starship Troopers is strictly speaking against militarism, but it depicts militarism that is antithetical to the Doctor. Um, I use The Handmaid's Tale to talk about feminism and the dangers of religion. I use 2001 to talk about Nietzsche's Ubermensch. Uh, I, I use, um, try, I'm going through, I use the movie The 13th Floor to talk about the legitimate possibility that we might actually be living in a computer simulation. Nick Bostrom, an Oxford professor, puts, puts the probability that we are in a computer simulation, actually really in one, at about 20%. And so I talk about why that number is so high for him and how it might actually be higher, what kind of arguments go into that. Um, I use AI, artificial intelligence, and uh, transcendence to talk about artificial intelligence. Is it possible? How should we treat it? Um, that kind of stuff, right? So if you want to take the course from me for college credit, you got to come to King's College in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania and you know become a student, sign up, and that's what you got to do. But if you just want the content- Signing up now, course, folks. Signing up now. But if you want, if you want the content of the course, you can get it through great Check courses, um, through all, 
please become a student. I've got adult students. That would be, I would, I would love it. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but, but anybody can get the content of the course. And if you really want to get the full version, do a video version, stream it via video, sign up for the, the, the Wondarium, the, the app, their, their streaming service, because there's all, like in the same way that I've got all kinds of nerdy stuff behind me here, um, and it's all around my office, I brought a lot of that to set. There's some visual gags that we pull off um, in, the, in, the, in the course, like dealing with alternate universes and goatees and that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's, it's a really fun course, but it's also very enlightening. I'm very, very proud of it. When they asked me to do it, um, they said, we're thinking about doing a kind of sci-fi as philosophy course. Would you be up for that? I literally said to myself out loud, sitting in this very chair, this was the role I was born to play. I have been preparing for this since I was eight years old and watched my first episode of Star Trek, right? <laughs> um, and I actually talk about that first episode and, and how it shaped me. So, um, what, what, so how the course will shape you, and this is what it does to my students, my students tell me this all the time, is that when you start to look at science fiction this way and see how it argues for certain philosophical topics, right? The matrix is a great example as it's arguing for the value of, of true belief that you don't wanna be fooled into thinking that the world is a different way than it actually is. Um, or, you know, the doctors arguing for pacifism by being a pacifist and making kind of making pacifistic stances and never using a weapon and that kind of stuff. That once you start to realize that this is what sci-fi is doing, you can never watch sci-fi the same again. Right. Uh, every time you go watch it, you see a Doctor Who or you watch a, you know, a, a sci fi movie uh, or television show, you'll always be seeing, oh, I see what they're getting at. I see what, what point they're trying to make. And it really, excuse me, I think it really enriches your, your view of, of science fiction in that way, but you'll never be able to view it kind of in the same way again. Right. Well, um, go ahead. Talking of science fiction television shows, you've written a book on the philosophy of the Orville. Now, on the surface, uh, Seth MacFarlane's sci-fi uh, comedy uh, just seems like light-hearted entertainment, but what philosophical arguments lie behind it? Well, so this, it, on the surface, it does look like that, right? But anybody who knows Star Trek realizes that the Orville's doing something very similar to what Star Trek does, right? And it's very TNG-ish. It's very much like the next generation Star Trek, right? Not like Discovery and Picard arts now. It's episodic and there seem to be morals every week. So not only is it like Star Trek in that they're in a starship traveling the galaxy and they're part of the Union rather than the Federation and there's all these similarities, but the show itself is doing something similar that Star Trek did, which is it has a moral every week, right? So for example, in the second episode, there um, and there, there's an all male an all male species called the Mocklins in the Orville universe, mm -hmm. um, and they are they're all male, right? Um, and there's a couple that's on the Orville, and they have a child, but it turns out the child is female, and this is supposed to be something that doesn't really happen or only happens every once in a while. And so there's this whole episode, like the 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 two the two Mocklins want to have the baby have a sex change, right? They want to change it into a male as an infant. And the doctor on the ship is like, no, I'm not going to do that because that's not, you know, it's Hippocratic Oath and all that. I only do things that are medically necessary and that's not medically necessary. And it's like, no, it's like a cleft palate. It's not like being female is not a, is not a birth defect, right? Like, and, and there is, right? And so there is, there is social commentary there about transgenderism. There's social commentary there about homosexuality, about society's acceptance of those. What do we go through? And like, what actually happens, this is a beautiful thing that happens in the episode, what happens in the episode is one of the Mocklins watches the claymation version of the, the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer story that we all grew up with, like, you know, from the 60s or whatever, right? And by watching that episode, so in the episode, he's watching that episode of, of that claymation, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. By watching it, his view changes, right? What was thought to be a problem with Rudolph, his red nose, turned out to be a benefit. You can never know how things, you know, the way that you're different will actually work out to be an advantage. And so he changes his mind and he doesn't want his daughter to have a sex change or his partner does, right? But this, this shows the power of science fiction to do what I call in the book, the Orville book, cloaking bias to create cognitive dissonance. When science fiction tells us, so here's what it is. When science fiction tells us a story, it is so seemingly far removed from the world that we don't bring any biases to it right? It cloaks our bias because we're dealing with something that we don't, we're not, 
we're not politically invested in, we're, we're not, we, we don't have any presuppositions. We leave our biases at the door and we, we evaluate the world and the story kind of on its own merits and we draw our conclusions about the story on its own merits. But then as the story concludes, so that, that's the cloaking bias part, right? As the story concludes, we then realize that this world is not so different at all, right? It's not different from our own world at all, right? So yeah, we don't have an all-male species and they randomly have a small baby, but we do have transgenderism in the world and we do have homosexuality in the world. And the way that they're treating this, 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 this female baby is the way that we often treat people who are you know, of, of different gender or, or transgender or who are homosexual and that there's this direct parallel. And that if I concluded that the way they were treating that female was wrong, but I don't think that the way that we treat transgender people are wrong, and yet these are the same way that we treat, I'm, that creates cognitive dissonance, right? I've, I've concluded one thing about this story about which I brought no bias, but I have a different opinion about what's going on in the world. Maybe I should reevaluate my opinion. Maybe I should reevaluate my, my position in the real world. So that, that creates that cognitive dissonance, and we have to resolve that conflict, and often it can change our view of the world. Right. Uh, another great example of this is actually one of my chapters in the Orville book. So it's an edited volume. I didn't write every chapter, but I, I have the introduction and two chapters. One's on time travel. Another one is about what was supposed to be the second episode that turned out to be the fourth episode of the Orville, um, which is not oh, not directly about climate change, but it's totally about climate change. <laughs> they come across this this generational planet. I'm sorry, generational ship. That is like uh, uh, it's wooded and it's got a uh, it's got an environment inside and no one inside the dome essentially knows that they're on a ship. They just think that that's all there is. But it turns out they're careening towards a, a, a black hole or a, a sun or a supernova or something, and they're going to be destroyed. And so the Orville they try to go in and warn them, right? What you are doing, you know, what your your world's about to be destroyed. You need to do something. And they refuse to believe it, despite all evidence to the contrary, despite you know everything, and despite that their very existence is on the line, they refuse to believe it because essentially the idea that there's something outside the dome is 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 contrary to their religious beliefs. And so, despite the fact that their religious, like despite the fact that they're going to die because of their religious beliefs, their religious beliefs are more important, and so they refuse to accept the evidence. Right, and when you realize that that's basically what a lot of people are doing with climate change, you realize that well, that's like that's the moral of the story. This is really a story about climate change. And if you find their denial of the truth so frustrating, but then you're a climate change denier, well, then maybe you might have to reevaluate that position. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that the, that the orbital does. That Star Trek did, by the way. Star Trek's doing the same kind of thing. For well, the Earth is hollow, and I have touched the sky. Yes, you are really. <laughs> Uh, helping us appreciate our favorite shows in a different way. Now, you also contributed to a study on Black Mirror. What uh, fascinates you about the various philosophical dilemmas portrayed in that TV show? Yeah, so the, the book is, uh, so the, the Orville book is called Exploring the Orville, um, uh, Exploring the Orville, Examining Seth, Mar Seth MacFarlane's Space Adventure. The Black Mirror book, and that's an edited volume. I wrote three of the chapters, but that's that's an edited volume. There's other authors in that book. Um, the Black Mirror book is also edited by me, and I actually didn't write a single chapter in it. I contributed to a couple of them. I didn't write any single one of them. Um, and the approach that I took was very similar as I took to the Orville and I took in the sci-fi course, because in my view, every Black Mirror episode, which again, like which viewers probably know, is a self-contained story. Right, every Black Mirror is, is, is a self-contained story, that there is a philosophical point to every one of those damn episodes, that there is something that Charlie Brooker is trying to get across. Uh, he may deny that. I've seen him say things that he's not trying to preach, and that, that, but he's got philosophical points and positions that he's trying. I mean, Smithereens is, a, is about the attention economy um, and our addiction to smartphones and mobile devices and how they are used to manipulate us and that kind of stuff. Um, White Bear, where the girl, the, the girl is her memory is wiped, and they punish her every day because of, uh, because of her participation in a crime. That is about criminal. That is about criminal justice and punishment, and what's just and unjust. Um, every episode's got a philosophical point. So the the point of the book, there's a chapter in the book for every episode, and it goes in order. Although you don't have to read it in order. Um, and so you can just choose your favorite episode, watch that episode, and then read the chapter on that episode to dig in deeper, right? And here's the fun thing about Black Mirror, like as also each individual episode's kind of got its own philosophical point. 
But as a whole, my view of Black Mirror is contrary to what a lot of people think it's about. A lot of people think Black Mirror is about the dangers of technology, right? Because in every episode, pretty much, there's some piece of technology that goes awry, that you know uh, uh, causes people to go astray, that is misused in some kind of way. Um, and so, right, like there's even um, there's a college humor bit where they have ye Black Mirror, and it's like if back Black Mirror was a play in the you know in the 1500s or whatever, right? Um, and you know, each each little episode of the play, you know, is, of the play is like, oh, here's this new piece of technology. It's a plow, right? And it makes farming even. Oh no, I dug my way to hell, right? And that's the big, <laughs> right? And like, it's every time it's like there's some bit of technology that makes you think it like makes your life easier, but it actually blows up in your face, right? Well, Brooker has said this, and this is my view as well. The ep the Black Mirror is not about the dangers of technology. He thinks that technology is neutral, it is a tool, and whether it is good or evil com depends completely on how we use it. And that what the technology does in the series, it's not evil in itself, what's evil is us. We have flaws, we have foibles. And what the technology does is allow those foibles to be magnified so that we can see them in grandiose detail and then we can recognize those foibles in us. Easy example, um, the entire history of you, hmm. where we have Liam and Fee, right? And this is the one where you have the grain in your eye and it can record and play back anything, right? What the grain allows Liam to do is to basically nitpick Fee and get into her private life and expose every little thing that she's done and figure out all of her secrets and all of her little details, right? Um, and he ends up ripping the grain out of his eye at the end because it ends up costing his marriage and his, and his child, right? And according to Brooker, it is his child, by the way. I don't know how you interpret, like does the authorial intent determine meaning, but Brooker has said it is, it is his child at the end. So he loses his wife and he loses his child simply because he couldn't let that obsession with, you know, kind of digging into all the minutia of Fee's life go. And that this, in, this, this obsession, this, noise, this, this nosiness was, been, been, was able, he would have been fine had it not been for the grain, right? But the grain allows it to, magnify. Actually, I say it, it, he may be fine. He probably would have, the same thing would have happened to him just under over a longer time scale if he hadn't had the grain, because this obsession of his was unhealthy. And that it, it helps us kind of reveal this kind of obsession that we can have and that we can ruin our own relationships and that we can ruin our own lives by essentially, for lack of better terms, being too nosy, being too obsessed with even our significant other's secrets and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I mean, ask yourself, right? Could any relationship really actually survive if each person in the relationship knew everything about the other person? All of their thoughts, all everything that goes through their head, their entire history, what they think on a daily basis. There's no way relationships could never survive because everybody's got skeletons. Everybody's got dark secrets. Everybody's got something. Those need to be hidden. And this desire to like pull them out and know everything ultimately isn't healthy. We can't, we can't survive with that kind of, and that's actually what that chapter was about. It's kind of like, would you want the grain if it was available? And the answer is you probably shouldn't. <laughs> Let's uh, go back to my obsession, Doctor Who. Sure, absolutely. Um, how, in your view, is modern Doctor Who changing the world in which we live now? Well, it certainly has changed, like, mm, that's a really good question. Um, it certainly has changed the elements of sci-fi. I think sci-fi has changed a little bit, right, um, as a result of the new Doctor Who, um, uh, talking post-2005 and on, right, the reboot, right? Um, I think the most uh, obvious way, um, yeah, I, I think this is probably the most kind of obvious answer to this question is the way it's trained, changed it most drastically is most recently with the introduction of a female doctor, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that this, that act in and of itself, I think challenges people's preconceptions about gender, can challenge people's preconceptions um, about, um, you know, what it means to be, well, what it means to be a time lord, right? But also like, the very conception of what 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 gender means does it make sense for you know something to change gender in that kind of way um and by just simply raising those kinds of questions i think it can that's probably the most challenging thing like that's certainly the thing that has 
that has raised the most feathers, right? That has hackled the most feathers, uh, that has raised the most questions kind of out in the out in the real world, right? Um, for me personally, philosophically, to kind of answer one of your questions before, the way it's changed me um, is to take pacifism more seriously. Um, another project of mine is the Pelgrave Handbook on, on Philosophy as Pop Culture, or uh, Pop Culture as Philosophy, excuse me. It's about 100 chapters. It's a huge, huge uh, project of mine. But one of them is on the doctor and his pacifism. And um, the idea that the, exactly the kind of pacifist that he is and whether or not that view is, is tenable. And it's kind of gotten me to take the position a little bit more seriously. Uh, specifically, the idea that um, maybe not that violence is never justified, but that it is justified far less frequently than we think it is. There are only rare, rare circumstances where violence can actually make situations better. Most of the time, all things considered, it makes it worse. And war almost always makes things worse. Um, uh, again, not always, but almost always makes things worse. Um, and that, uh, that, that's that been kind of a personally challenging view to me, because I, I guess I used to kind of be a just war theorist. Um, and I think that war is justified in a lot fewer circumstances because of thinking about the doctrine as pacifism and, and what it amounts to. Yeah. Let me, um, in a couple of minutes we have left, raise a question that's itself caused some own controversy online. Do you see any similarities, as some have, between the doctor and Jesus? Um, yeah, well, he raises from the dead, all right? Mm -hmm. There's one similarity, right? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, and he even take, like, um, you know, according to some Christian belief, right, when Jesus rose, he took on a new ethereal form, like he didn't get a regular body, he got a new body. You might call that regeneration, right? <laughs> All the cells replaced each, you know, one another and that kind of stuff, right? Um, and then certainly the doctor has sacrificed himself in certain kinds of ways before, um, you know, for the greater good and that kind of stuff, right? So um, you could certainly see him in that way. And he's kind of a moral teacher in a certain kind of way. And Jesus is a moral teacher, right? So he certainly teaches us morals about pacifism, you know, as I was uh, speaking about a while ago. Um, and, but he's unlike, you know, at least the biblical Jesus, as, as Jesus is described, you know, in the Bible, the disciples never correct or guide Jesus along a moral path, right? He never gets things wrong in the disciples. Well, maybe you should come back this way or whatever, right? Whereas, the doctor's disciples, his companion, and there is another comparison, right? The doctor and Jesus both had disciples in a certain kind of way. Um, but the doctor's disciples and his companions will sometimes correct him, as we mentioned before, right? Martha corrects him at Vesuvius, or not Martha. Um, Donna corrects him at Vesuvius, and Amy corrects him with the star whale, right? Um, those kind of things can happen, and that's a little bit unlike Jesus, right? So, but yeah, there's certainly some similarities. He's a bit of a Messiah figure. Um, I can see that, but, you know, so is Neo in the Matrix, you know, so. And you are a moral teacher yourself, uh, Dr. David Kyle Johnson. Um, do you have a final takeaway for our SD HUCON uh, viewers as they reflect on uh, all the things you've said today? Um, I guess you, when you watch Doctor Who or any kind of sci-fi, um, don't just do it for entertainment. Look for the deeper message, look for the deeper meaning um, and see if you can A, figure out what that meaning is, what that message is, what point it's got, and then B, don't just take it for like, there's some say, oh, and it must be right. Like examine it. Is, is it a good point? Is it a good argument? Is it a position that's, that's defensible? Is an argument given? If, if so, is the argument any good? Um, I think that this, I think that sci-fi that does that is better sci-fi, right? I don't think like Star Wars doesn't do that as much as Star Trek. And this is one of the reasons I kind of like Star Trek maybe a little bit better than I do Star Wars, although I, I love Star Wars too. Um, but, uh, but because Star Trek is a little bit more philosophical in that way, I'm kind of, I'm kind of a bigger fan of Star Trek. Um, and because I think Doctor Who does that, I'm a big fan of Doctor Who as well. Um, and so I think that that makes for better sci-fi, but it also makes for a better sci-fi watching experience. Um, it, it enriches the science fiction when you can kind of see and, and engage with the art form um, in that kind of way. Well, you've made some new fans today. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on. Did you want to see my action figures?